Good afternoon, everybody, and you're very welcome to this webinar hosted by the National Rural Network. Uh, the National Rural Network, as probably you all know, is a, an organization funded by the Department of Agriculture. And the aim is that we promote uh, the initiatives and the objectives of the Rural Development Programme. Uh, today, we're concentrating particularly on biodiversity and looking to see what are the upcoming policies and what of the policies which we are already trying to implement through various schemes, etc., are working and what's not. Uh, we want as much audience participation as possible. We don't have any presence for the audience to give out, but we are asking you to get involved with us and submit your questions. If you have them, you can see at the bottom of the screen, the question and answer tab, you simply type your question in there and we'd love to get the questions. We'll do our best to deal with them uh, and we'll have the two speakers opinion on them. Uh, so we're recording today uh, so that the presentations can be shared afterwards and they will be available on the NRN website. So today's webinar, as I said at the beginning, is to highlight what efforts agriculture can make to support biodiversity. It's intended to highlight the, the policies and the regulations and, as I said, what's working and what isn't working in relation to biodiversity. So over the next hour or so, we're going to uh, explore the various scenes. We're, we're very fortunate to have two really high class speakers today. We have from the, our first presentation will be by a Department of Agriculture inspector, Mr. Neil Ryan. Uh, he's based in the nitrates and biodiversity section of the department. Neil graduated uh, with a BAG degree from UCD in 1992 and has had a, a long career and, and involved career since, involving teaching, working with Chagask, technical representative with a commercial company. And then he joined the department and since then has been assigned in various areas in the organic unit in the department based in Johnstown Castle and later uh, in the environment and structures at headquarters, again in Johnstown Castle. And his duties included indeed back in the day, development of the, the schemes and reps and, and EOS, et cetera, and the current GLOSS scheme. Uh, so a few years ago, Niall moved to the crop evaluation. And from there, he has moved to the nitrates and biodiversity division of Johnstown Castle. So I suppose that's a, a lifetime experience more or less, even though he tells me he trained as a, a reps planner back in the day when I did myself. And when he comes up on screen, you'll see he's managed to age a lot better than I have. Anyway, so uh, now I will spend the next 20 minutes or so uh, with a, a good presentation. I've had a preview and very enjoyable and informative dealing with biodiversity and the common agricultural policy. And again, if you have questions, put them in as we go. We'll probably take the two presentations first and then we'll deal with questions. Thanks. Over to you, Niall. Thanks, Philip. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to share my screen with you there now. As Philip said, uh, I work in the, in the Department of My Country, the Nitrates and Biodiversity Division. I'm here uh, in this division just over a year now, but I have a a long-standing um, experience in agri-environmental schemes. Um, I do remember, yes, I, I, I went to the first uh, uh, reps advisor training session uh, back in the day. And um, I suppose the, the hair has got a lot grayer since, that's all I can say. But just starting off, what I'm going to talk about today is um, cap policies supporting biodiversity and um, where, where they have kicked in along the, the, the progression of CAP. And I suppose I'm going to take a step backwards first before we take a step forwards and look at the CAP itself. Uh, in 1962, the CAP was born. And basically, I suppose back in that day, the CAP was all about um, producing food for the EU citizens. And 
and showing a fair standard for li of living for the for the farmers in Europe. So it was a partnership then between agriculture society. And I just uh, the reason I've gone back to the very start of the cap is there actually isn't no mention of biodiversity at this point in time. So the cap has gone through a number of reforms through the decades in the 80s, in particular the market supports. But I'm just looking at it from the biodiversity perspective in today's webinar. And I suppose the first uh, real reform that introduced biodiversity was back in 1992. And that was part of the, the Ray McSharry reforms. Our own commissioner Ray McSharry was involved. And basically what happened then is we had uh, price supports were scaled back and they were replaced with direct payments to farmers. And farmers then at this point in time were encouraged to be more environmental friendly. So we had int introduction of the REP scheme, which was our first rural environmental protection scheme. And also I suppose what was considered to be environmental friendly at that time was the introduction of set aside for cereals, where land was set aside for a period of maybe one year or up to five years for just being left idle. And that was also seen as a biodiversity measure. Um, I suppose the REPS one itself, like was our, say, our first like, environmental scheme. It was a voluntary scheme and it was available to all farmers in the country. And an agri-environmental plan had to be prepared by a prof professional advisor. And there was a, a rep specification there and it had 11 basic measures and six supplementary measures. So the supplementary measures were in addition to the basic measures if farmers wished to, uh, to undertake any of those measures, but there was 11 basic measures and farmers had to deliver on all of those measures if they had those measures on their farm. And then they received a per hectare payment then um, for delivering on those measures. I suppose moving on then, um, that was Reps 1. There was a reform of the, of the cap again in 1999. And I suppose at this point in time, there was two pillars introduced to the cap. It was Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. And all of the, the Pillar 2 um, schemes were known as the rural development measures. And, and under the reform in, 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 in 2000, you had agri-environmental schemes became compulsory for every member state. So it, it, the, the, the rural development period covered from 2000 to 2006. So Ireland introduced the REPS2 program, which was really a follow on from REPS1. And also then we introduced a, a, a less favored area scheme based on area. So that was for farmers farming um, was what was deemed as less favored lands. There was, there was a, 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 a per hectare payment because uh, approximately 70% of our land is 72% is classified as less favored because I suppose we are an island in west of Europe and, and a lot of our, our land is difficult to farm. So we, we, we qualified to pay out on less favored. So that action is also seen as, 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 as beneficial for biodiversity because farmers generally in the less favored areas are keeping lower stocking rates and have generally some of the higher nature value land in the country. Again, in 2003 came a reform and that also impacted on, on how we delivered for biodiversity. Um, this was a reform in the middle of a, a programming period, but basically it what it did was on the pillar one side, it cut the link between, um, between um, production and subsidies. So farmers could receive an income support by just looking after the land, keeping it in good environmental uh, condition. And we had the introduction of the single farm payments, but they were subject to cross compliance. So cross compliance was introduced back in 2003. So cross compliance set the baseline for all farmers. Cross compliance is made up of strategy management requirements and GEC requirements. So there was 13 SMRs and seven GECs. So farmers had to, in order to receive their single farm payment, they had to abide by these cross compliance standards. So they set, set the baseline. 
And I suppose this is a slide I've taken from the European Court of Auditors. And cross compliance in itself is seen to be supporting and improving biodiversity. And you can see there that of the SMRs, SMR1 is, is to do with the nitrates, SMR2 and SMR3 are to do with the habitats directive, the birds directive and the habitats directive. So they introduced environmental conditions that farmers had to ad ad adhere to. On the GAEC side, EC, GAEC side the, the good agricultural environment conditions, we had seven of those and you can see GEC one, four, five, six and seven we're all about looking after and improving biodiversity. So as a result of the introduction of cross compliance, as I said, they introduced the baseline, farmers had to meet, but then we had to revise reps because some of the, 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 the um, items, the measures in reps that we were paying on were now baseline. So we had to go and deliver above the baseline. So therefore we introduced two categories of biodiversity options, category one and category two, and farmers had to select uh, one action out of each of those options. There's just a quick list of the, of the options that were introduced. They were introduced on, 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 on measures two, three, four, five, seven, eight, and nine. And uh, farmers could choose to deliver one of those. You could do two category one options, or but you must do a minimum of one category one. So I suppose basically that's the first time in Reps 3 we've looked at enhancing uh, biodiversity up to, I suppose, Reps 1 and Reps 2. One could argue that we were protecting biodiversity and preserving biodiversity. But this now in Reps 3, we're trying to add on and enhance biodiversity. So then that led us on to, 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 to the next programming period of the CAP, which was 2007, 2013. And we had an introduction of REPS 4. So that was our fourth iteration of, of our REPS program. And introduced in, in, in August 2007. And unfortunately, it closed fairly quickly in July 2009 due to budgetary constraints. The payments for REPS 4 were a bit higher than REPS 3. And for the first time, nitrates derogation farmers were entitled to apply for a, a rural environmental protection scheme. And I suppose the, 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 the nitrates derogation farmers then, they had to deliver two category one biodiversity options and one category two. So also part of this CAP programming period, um, the less favored area scheme changed into the disadvantaged area scheme. So to, again, to support farmers farming in less intensive areas and looking after the environment. Oh my God. I don't know what's after happening here, but. I have a glitch on the system, but basically my apologies for if anyone heard that horrible noise. But we have reps four then, with 44, reps one, we had 44,000, nearly 45,000 farmers in it. Reps two and three, we had um, in the period we had, nearly 60,000 farmers participating in reps four then until it closed with over 30,000 farmers participating. So when reps four closed down, there was a health check of CAP in the year of 2009. And as a result of that, we introduced the Agri-Environmental Options Scheme, AOS, and the Natura 2000 scheme. They existed on the one application, although there were two separate schemes and had to report it back to the commission separately. EOS 1, we had... My apologies, I'm not sure what's after happening here. EOS 1, we had 9,000. EOS 2, we had around nearly 7,000 farmers and EOS 3. So we had three iterations of the EOS scheme. And then, there was a further reform of the CAP in 2013. And this covered the programming period 2014 to 2020. And on the pillar one side, our single farm payments were replaced and the basic payment scheme was introduced. And along with that was the greening payment for environmental and public goods was introduced. So this was an introduction 
for the first time then on the pillar one side, the cap, where environmental and public goods had to be delivered. So it was known as greening and 30% of a farmer's um, original single farm payments were now paid out as a greening payment. So in order to deliver that to farmer, there was no plowing of permanent pasture. Now this was managed at a national level rather than an individual farm level and there was crop diversification. So it really, it, crop diversification came in for tillage farmers. For farmers, if you're growing more than 10 hectares of cereals, you have to have at least two crops. And more than 30 hectares of cereals, you have to have three crops. And then it also, for farmers of more than 15 hectares, they had to introduce ecological focus areas on their farm. 5% of the tillage area had to be an ecological focus area, which uh, could have been a length of hedgerow, or they could have grown a catch crop um, to, to meet that. So this was the first introduction on the pillar one side of some biodiversity type measures. On the pillar two side, again, we had, it, we had um, rural development measures for biodiversity in the form of GLASS, which is our current uh, green or carbon agri-environmental scheme, which I'll look at in a bit more detail now. We have the area of natural constraint scheme, which replaces what was the the disadvantage area scheme, which was for farmers in the, the less intensive or the less favored areas. So we also introduced uh, European innovation partnerships under the current uh, CAP program, under Pillar 2, under our rural development program. We have the Burn program, and we also have the organic farming scheme. And I just want to say in relation to organic farming scheme, organic farming scheme has always been part of our REPS program as one of the, the, the um, supplementary measures so since REPS was introduced, as I say, back in 1994, we had a, a, an organic farming um, action there as part of that program. But now, since um, for the last period, it's, it's a standalone program. So most people out there probably are, for, are well familiar with this now, the green low carbon scheme. So look at one of the objectives of the is promoting biodiversity and I suppose our current glass scheme is a targeted scheme. And we looked and uh, it's a tiering system and we've identified what was called priority environmental assets. So if some farmers had these assets, such as natura sites, we had a number of farmland birds, cottages, high status water, a rare breed you automatically had access into the scheme. So glass, so basically, as I said, it was a tiering, a targeted scheme, a tiering scheme, and there was tier 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, and then for farmers, it could come in under general actions. We had three tranches of glass, and uh, as everyone that, that, that may be in the scheme knows, the glass one and two participants were due to finish this year, but we're going to have a rollover, which I'll touch later. And, and there's... There's 48,000, currently there's 48,377 participants in GLASS. Originally we had, there was 50,000 people approved into the scheme, but over time you would get retirements and people land being transferred and in general you just get uh, numbers decreased over time. This is a map here now that shows, I suppose, spatially where the GLASS participants are lo located. And our highest number of participants are in the western seaboard and this really mirrors what we have seen in all our agri-environmental schemes to date. In generally, all our ag most of the people that participate in agri-environmental schemes come from the extensive areas of the country in general. But as you can see, there is a quite dispersed throughout the whole country in relation to, 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 to glass. I suppose that's why we, 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 we targeted glass a bit more this time to try to get more intensive guys into the glass that wouldn't have been intention that wouldn't have been in glass before and 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 um, and that has worked to some extent i suppose the other measures for biodiversity that's part of the, the current rural development program would be our innovation european innovation partnerships or eips so these are locally led projects and um Basically, there's 23 of them in total, and 18 of them have a biodiversity focus. There's two major projects in it, the, the Hen Harrier project and the Pearl Mussel projects. 
So those were agreed the start ever before we launched the locally led projects. But basically, the locally led projects are where um, projects looking at a, a maybe at a, a particular interest and 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 trying to develop that and to see what works best for that environmental or particular interest. As I said, the the the, the two big flagships are the Boron or the the the. Um, Hen Harrier and the freshwater pearl mussel. We also have some very good other ones, such as the, the um, pollinator plan and uh, a number of the, the sewers and the upland projects. So we also have the Burren program. Uh, the Burren program is also a, 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 is a more as a results based agri environmental scheme for the Burren region. And then we also introduced again the organic farming scheme. So I suppose that's a quick run through of all the schemes we've had, um, uh, supported by CAP, really with the, with, with the main focus on, and I suppose they have been in existence now since the of these um, schemes throughout the programming period, and they all more or less have said that the schemes uh, seem to be delivering for, for, for um, what they intended. However, we all know that biodiversity is in decline, and back in 2019, the European Court of Auditors were commissioned to do a study on um, biodiversity and the CAP. And the report was published this year from the European Court of Auditors. And basically, this has the report has said that CAP, the CAP contribution has not halted the decline of biodiversity. So they, this was, as I said, the European Court of Auditors um, report. There was a uh, part of the audit. There was uh, five countries selected to be inspected and visited. And Ireland was one of those. And we had the Court of Auditor here last year. And basically they looked at all of our policies. They looked at all of our schemes. They interviewed, um, us in authorities, our colleagues in the National Parks and Wildlife Service, who are, I suppose, ultimately responsible for biodiversity policy in Ireland and, and reporting on biodiversity policy, who we would work closely with. And they interviewed a number of NGOs and um, agricultural advisors, etc. So it was a, it was a, a certainly a, a they looked at every aspect of 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 from cross compliance the whole way up. Um, greening and, and all our agri environmental schemes. And it shows a number of farmers and projects to go and visit, and, and they did so. And they did that in five other countries. And then they did survey work and other work in other member states. So I suppose what they defined, and the findings are as follows. So they said the Commission overestimates the amount of money it spends on biodiversity each year. The Commission themselves would maintain to spend 8% of all the of all the, the, the cap money is, is spent on biodiversity. Um, so and most cap funding has little positive impact on biodiversity. And most direct payments do not maintain or enhance farmland biodiversity. And the cross-compliance san sanctions have no clear impact on farmland biodiversity. And all, so says that the potential of greening could be improved and some rural development schemes have potential for improving far farmland biodiversity. So they looked at all the agri-environmental schemes and then they said less demanding agri-environmental climate measures have higher participating rates. And there's one, I suppose, all of these are seems to be in the negative, but there is one positive in the whole lot and that's results-based schemes have a positive effect, but they're rare. But as I said, we have introduced under our EIPs and the Burn program have introduced very successful results-based um, measures in their in, in their programs. So going forward, looking at where CAP is for biodiversity. So currently we're in a, a reform period again. And the the reform period covers the, 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 the next CAP programming period is 2021 20, to 2027. So the legislative text has been produced by the EU Commission back in 2018. And there was 
nine specific objectives of the CAP. Three of them, climate action, environment, and landscape and biodiversity are the three on the environmental side. And I suppose just the following just gives an idea of the, of the current structure and the proposed new structure. So under our current CAP, we have on the pillar one side, we have cross compliance and greening. And then on the pillar two side, we have the rural development programming and the agri-environmental climate schemes. So what's proposed in the new CAP is that the cross compliance and greening are put together with strength and conditionality is called. And then we have eco schemes on pillar one, and then we have agri-environmental schemes in pillar two. Niall, we're yeah. under a little bit of time All right. pressure. Sorry, I'll move on. Very sorry. So look at basically going forward, we have the new CAP really sets out higher environmental ambition. We have cross compliance is, 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 is gone and conditionality is in. We have pillar one eco schemes, pillar two eco schemes. So as I said, the conditionality is an amalgamation of cross compliance and greening. So we're going to see more SMRs and GECs. The eco scheme itself then is on the pillar one side. So now farmers in receipt of, of, of income support payments are going to have to deliver more for the environment. Again, it's voluntary but a percentage of their, of their, of their payments, will, if they want to get this, will, will have to become delivering environmental goods on their pillar one side. It's an annual payment and funded on the pillar one. The pillar two, we will have another agri-environmental climate measure. Again, it will be voluntary. And obviously then, like all of our previous schemes, payments for agri-environmental climate measures can only be given for interventions going above the, the SMRs and GECs, which will now be um, conditionality going forward. I suppose, again, in the scheme design of AECMs, and this is what a lot of people don't know, our payments are based on income costs incurred and income foregone. And obviously then there's a training element to it. So what has happened in the meantime, since the, the legislative text has been produced by the commission, we have the introduction of the European Green Deal. And two main elements of the Green Deal are the farm to fork strategies and the EU biodiversity strategies. So those have set, I suppose, uh, targets that member states must look at in designing their, their next cap. So what else is new on the new going forward is we no longer have direct pillar one and pillar two. We have a cap strategic plan that has to be put in place. And each member state then will have to put in their plan how they're going to set out meeting these targets to, 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 towards the nine objectives. Um, there is a consultation process with all of this, and there is a CAP consultative committee, and many external um, NGOs, advisory service would be on, on the CAP consultative committee. And th th there was a process of a SWOT analysis being done. And there was a public consultation on the SWOT analysis. So we'll have to send our SWOT analysis to the, to the EU Commission. And then from your SWOT analysis, you'll have to get in, uh, um, a needs assessment. And from that, then you'll introduce schemes. So I suppose we all know that there was a delay with the rollout of the new cap. And we're still negotiating some of the, 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 the text and, and, and looking for uh, clarification on some of the, uh, of, of the items that is in the proposed new cap, but because of Brexit, obviously, and because of, 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 of um, COVID, so there's going to be a transitionary period. So we've just announced, our minister just announced there in the last week or so, that GLASS will roll over, our ANC will roll over, our organic farming scheme will continue, the burn program will continue for another year, and EIPs will continue to be funded for another year. So we're currently looking at introducing some new measures or schemes in the transitional period. We're currently looking at developing a results-based pilot agri-environmental scheme. We're looking at a farm environmental study, introducing a soil sampling program, and introducing advisor training all in the area of biodiversity. I suppose the second last slide is, I just want to be, I suppose, mindful that agriculture and environment can go hand in hand. And we have to be mindful of that and deliver both together. So I just thank you then and sorry, Chairman, if I've gone over the time.
Liam, thank you very much. Uh, all of it was very worthwhile, a very full presentation, and it was it really useful to get the historical background before pointing out where, where we're probably going in the future. It puts it in context and makes it maybe more understandable. We'll move on now, uh, rather than, than take any questions at the moment, I want to move on and introduce the second guest, uh, Dr. Liam Lysett. Uh, Liam is Centre Director or Manager, I guess, of the National Biodiversity Data Centre, and that's an organisation that collates and manages data on biodiversity and wildlife in Ireland. Uh, wildlife or biodiversity data are key requirements for, for understanding the natural surroundings and for tracking changes as they're happening in our environment and getting a better insight. It's the kind of stuff we probably all knew as children and our busy lives have managed to let us forget most of it. But it's very important that it's tracked and that any changes can be seen before they happen and, and noticed. The data center works with partner organizations and other national uh, initiatives to ensure that biodiversity data is available for decision making and for the, the community generally. Uh, Liam is probably one of the most experienced conservationists working in Ireland at the moment. So without praising you too much more, Liam, I'd ask you to make your presentation. Listen, thank you very much, Philip. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and thanks for the invitation to talk uh, at this webinar. Um, I suppose I'm going to take a small little bit of a different stance or a different approach than Niall because I suppose I'm coming at it primarily from, well, exclusively really from a, a biodiversity perspective. And um, I think it's useful to try to get the perspective of biodiversity uh, in this discussion um, to kind of frame, I suppose, frame our, uh, the debate maybe and to, to contextualize some of the trends we're seeing. And one of the things that I, I really like this kind of a forum, uh, particularly for the natural rural, um, National Rural Network in that there's uh, opportunities for debate because I think this whole area around biodiversity and farming is really a, a battlefield. And I think we should try to move away from that and have a mutual understanding of, of perspectives. So I, I, as I mentioned, I just want to, to give an overview of kind of the perspective of someone who's deeply concerned about biodiversity and actually thinks that the only way that we can address uh, biodiversity loss in the wider countryside is actually uh, getting the support of the agricultural sector and farming to help us to do that. So my presentation, there's five elements to it. I just want to talk a small little bit about biodiversity loss in agriculture just to set the scene. I think it's important to give the historical background of where we are um, because if we don't understand where we are, we don't really know where the baseline is. Uh, I'm going to say a very small amount about the policy framework because I really want to try to get a discussion going. Um, I feel strongly that we need to change the narrative around biodiversity and agriculture, so I want to make a few comments about that. And then I'm going to end up with, with more kind of personal observations. The whole intention of these is I want to try to help stimulate questions and answers at the end. They're only my personal observations, but I think they might... They're kind of high level and they, they, they do give us a perspective on what, um, what we need to address, I think, to make agriculture and biodiversity more compatible with one another. So to begin with then, we know it's definitive. Well, the, first of all, we should say that the, Ireland was the second country, I think, to declare uh, a climate and biodiversity emergency. Dáil Éireann declared that, and I think that's very important. And there's, there's no denying, there's no getting away from the fact that um, we're in the middle of a biodiversity emergency, uh, species and habitats are declining, and there's also no denying the fact that actually agriculture has played its role in impacting on biodiversity loss. It's not by any means the only sector, but it certainly is a significant one. And recently, in the recently published Ireland's Environment uh, Report by the EPA, there's statistics here in terms of what are the threats um, and the pressures from um, uh, on, on the priority habitats, on the habitats of high conservation value. And you can see that agriculture is top of the list here. If we look at the situation then in relation to species of high conservation concern, agriculture seems to be less important as a, as a detrimental factor. It's still important, but there are others as well. So I suppose I'm not trying to finger agriculture. There's a lot of different pressures on species of high conservation value and habitats of high conservation, but agriculture does play a role. And it's important, I think, to actually 
uh, recognize that up front. In terms of kind of biodiversity and, and farmland, I suppose there are, um, at the moment, there are what I'd call key or totem species. These are the kind of iconic species that there's a lot of effort made to try to conserve these and to link the conservation of these uh, species with agricultural policy. Of course, corn crake is the one that's probably best known. Um, sadly, it's now restricted to the, to the northwest of Ireland, uh, having gone from the, the, the Shannon Callows, despite the fact of agri-environment schemes being in place. There's the freshwater peril mussel, um, and there's uh, the, the, the curlew, for example. Curlew still occurs in good numbers in winter, but as a breeding species, it's in absolutely in a, a really treacherous uh, state. I suppose the key thing is that there are structures, there are efforts in place to deal with some of these, what I call totem species, in terms of agricultural policy. Some of the, some of the, the schemes have worked well, others have worked less well, but I suppose the structures are in place, there's a recognition that needs to be done. We probably just need to uh, try harder to achieve conservation of these species within the context of agricultural policy. Um, then, of course, the other ones, what I'd call non-totem species, are there's, there's overall there's been a decline in farmland birds. Uh, things like the rock dove, um, uh, sorry, the stock dove is the one, the, the, is the species that's in serious decline. And the corn bunting bottom right has become extinct as a breeding species in around 2020. And then with the little finch, the um, twite and yellowhammer. There's a lot of species of birds whose ranges have contracted and really one of the common factors, I think, in terms of their decline is that there's less floral diversity in the Irish countryside. I think that's a kind of common, um, all-encompassing en trend. I think we can agree that has a detrimental impact on all aspects of biodiversity and an agricultural landscape. There's less floral diversity. Um, I'm focusing here on trends in the status of birds in Ireland because this, this is a the Countryside Bird Survey is the longest running um, monitoring scheme, the citizen science monitoring scheme organized by Birdwatch Ireland. And if you look at the, the graph in orange, it shows you the, the, the kind of index of the trends in farmland bird, birds since 1998. If you look at this, uh, 1998 is, is taken as the base year. And if you track the changes or the index in farmland birds, you see that we're not doing too badly. In fact, if anything, the population index has increased over the time. But this is a slightly misleading picture. If we compare, for example, the decline in farmland birds in the UK, this is the red line at the bottom. You can see that there's been a catastrophic de decline in the, in the farmland bird index since 1970 in the UK. We can probably say we're not doing as badly, which is good. But I just want to show you, if you plot the UK, uh, or sorry, the Irish bird index on the same scale as the, Euro, the UK one, you can see that the, the monitoring scheme, although the Countryside Bird Survey is the longest running one, it's only been operational since 1998. So effectively, what we're catching is only the last uh, 20 years or so in terms of the status of farmland birds. It's very possible that actually we've also suffered a huge decline since 1970, since we joined the European Union or the EEC at the time, but that we don't have the stats or we don't have the data to able to quantify the changes to the countryside that have happened right through the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s, times when there was a huge land use change. So it's important to say there is a deficit in terms of data, in terms of population declines of biodiversity. We're quite fortunate that we've also established a butterfly and bumblebee monitoring programs, the National Biodiversity Data Center, relying on citizen scientists. We established these only back in, um, you know, they've only been running for eight years in the case of the bumblebee scheme and only th uh, 12 years in the case of the butterfly scheme. But at least we now we have empirical data to be able to show how some group of insects is faring the Irish countryside. And it's showing, for example, the small heat is part of the butterfly, is one of the butterflies that's, that likes kind of rough, marginal agricultural land, um, light grassland areas. And you can see that the population has declined by 77% uh, 
um, since 19, 2008. This is a catastrophic decline, decline in a species that really doesn't have all that very specific habitat requirements, but is a kind of a generalist of, you know, low intensity agricultural land, I suppose. And the question is, we have the evidence now, we're seeing this, and I, I still don't understand what process or mechanism is in place for us when we're seeing these red flags, and this is a red flag in terms of species decline, how that can translate into agricultural policy. You know, there seems to be huge time lag, and this time lag, I think, is, detriment, is detrimental to um, taking action to address declines when we find them. Okay, I mentioned that we don't actually have quantitative data in terms of species um, declines from the 1970s. We're really only getting the tail end of what's happening. But there are some surrogate measures of changes to land use that we can show, which will give uh, an indication of the scale of landscape change that has happened in the Irish countryside, which no doubt has had a huge impact on biodiversity. One of the biggest, and perhaps you could argue one of the, the most damaging from a biodiversity perspective, but which has enabled good agricultural um, farming and, uh, to occur, has been the arterial drainage programs. They've been going since the mid 1980, uh, the 1800s. But over these schemes, there's been a total of about 30% of the land has been, uh, has been drained. And of course, this enables then further field drainage and what we'd call agricultural improvement of grasslands. There's also been a, a big increase in the use of nitrogen since the 1960s and 1970s. Granted, that has declined a small bit in, the, in recent years, but this huge increase in nitrogen use has actually had profound impact on the availability of, of um, floral diversity in Irish countryside. The more vigorous the growth of grasses, the less diverse the swords tend to be, and this has had a big impact on biodiversity as well. And the consequence of this is that we've lost huge amount of species rich gra grassland. I'm sadly I'm of the vintage that I remember walking through fields in North Kerry that were one after another were like this. You go to North Kerry now, and it's just uh, it's just a gra it's just a, a desert of, of green from a biodiversity perspective. So we have to understand that what we're dealing with now is really the tail end of a huge scale of biodiversity loss. And we, we need to understand that because that's important if we understand where the baseline we're starting from is. Of course, we're not just talking about species, we're really talking about ecosystem services. And if you see a decline in things like species rich grasslands and insect life, we're actually reducing the ability of the landscape to be resilient to deal with things like climate change and provide us with services that we can enable us to, to grow healthy, uh, healthy food and diverse food, for example. And I suppose the, 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 the pollinator services are the one services that are best known. And um, thanks to a colleague of mine, Una uh, Fitzpatrick and Jane Stout, they, they've initiated the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. It's been hugely successful. But it's shown that we have a really strong decline in terms of the services that the countryside is providing to us in terms of eco ecosystem services. And I suppose I would make the point is then what about soil biodiversity and the ecosystem services it's provide? I think it's the one area that really needs a lot of work. And I'm really delighted to hear that there's going to be a, a national soil sampling uh, survey. And I hope that there's a very strong element of biodiversity in that, in that survey. So really, I suppose the point I want to make is that in terms of kind of most agricultural productive systems, biodiversity has become a marginalized um, service, I suppose, and it's confined now to marginal and non-productive parts of farms. And we have to understand that. But against that, at the other end of the spectrum, the exception is these high nature value farming systems, which are totally dependent on agricultural activity to be maintained and they're of inordinate value, really, both socially and environmentally. Really, culturally, they're really important. Um, so agricultural policy has the challenge, I suppose, of spanning the spectrum of trying to deal with um, biodiversity loss, hoping it won't get worse in some of the more productive agricultural areas, to trying to sustain maybe a, a way of life or a way of, of, of farming that has ha, uh, is, is more difficult to, to maintain in this day and age. So it's a very broad brush policy that agriculture has to deal with, particularly in terms of delivering on biodiversity. Okay, I, I'm, I've, I've stolen this um, 
this diagram then from a group uh, of experts who've been working from the Farming for Nature uh, technical group. And this is a group that was convened by the Heritage Council to provide some advice in terms of agricultural policy in light of the new CAP, uh, the farm to fork and the, the, green, the green architecture. Um, I don't really, I, I'm not trying to steal this and I hope the, the authors don't mind me using this, but I just want to try to give this as an example of the type of innovative policy I think that would really work for biodiversity within the, agri within the agricultural policy context. So this is just the kind of structure, don't, please don't worry about the detail, but just in terms of the kind of structure. It's um, based on different tiers and different levels of ambition, I suppose. The first is the enhanced baseline conditionality one. This would set minimum standards for all farming really uh, to adhere to. And they should guarantee, I think, basically that there's no net habitat loss. Any features of biodiversity value within farmland should be seen as an asset and definitely it should stop the, the, the further decline of the biodiversity value of farmland. Um, the next then is an eco schemes. Niall has mentioned this, but these should promote a specific biodiversity enhancement measures that can help biodiversity functioning within farmland. These should be targeted and there should be a very clear statement in terms of what they're trying to achieve. The third then really is the higher uh, tier three and you know the kind of structure that might work well is having a national agri-environmental scheme that would be open to everyone that would raise standards in terms of biodiversity value across the land but that would be supplemented then by another much more ambitious one I suppose which would be targeted to enable targeting to specific challenges specific objectives or to specific areas I think one of the challenges that faces biodiversity policy uh, sorry agricultural policy and biodiversity is that there needs to be some element of strategy built into it where we can identify regionally or uh, issue-wise uh, the cumulative impact of, of farming activity and target in a certain area because this kind of broad uh, the broad network where you try to get most farmers in on a voluntary basis uh, is limited it would be good to have a scheme where you could really crank up the objectives and target an area at, at a strategic level for enhancements. I don't want to really say any more than this, but these kind of structures, this kind of innovative policy framework where you're encouraging uh, best practice and you're trying to up the ante in terms of ambition is really what we need to do. And, and to be fair, the, 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 the new um, green uh, architecture really enables that to happen if, if, if member states want to so want to do that. Okay, I, I want to move back down then to one of the issues that I find is kind of saddens me in terms of the debate. I don't, it's not even a debate, but once you talk about farming and agriculture, it really has become a battlefield. And I think um, if there was anything that we could do to try to, you know, get people down and to get some kind of unity of purpose and even a better understanding of what, what needs to be done, it, it, is, it should be achieved. And I have to say the work that the Farming for Nature group that are doing is, is tremendous. And they're producing these kind of infographics which show you really clearly in terms of what constitutes good, good practice for biodiversity and what constitutes poor practice. And they've produced these kind of um, diagrams to show you really what's involved. And I don't want to go through these in detail, but like these should be, these should be basic information that is in every farmer's tractor on every kitchen table. And if we're really serious about integrating biodiversity within agriculture, the impact of actions and management on farmland, uh, the impact it has on biodiversity has to become a co core component of agricultural activity. I mean, it can't be seen as something extra, extra or something add on. Farmers need to appreciate and there needs to be an understanding that, you know, it's, it's their choices what actions they take and each action will have a consequence, good or bad, on the biodiversity value of the countryside. And these are, again, I don't want to, I'm conscious of the time, I don't want to go in detail, but they clearly set out what's good for biodiversity and what isn't. This one is just basically a, an overview of what well-managed farms for biodiversity look like. There's another one produced, which is what well-managed hedgerows look like. I mean, these are, these are beautiful, they're very simple. And there's no longer the excuse really that, or there shouldn't be an excuse that we don't know what's good practice needed. Um, you know, this is, this is setting the bar, I think actually it's particularly low. 
we should aspire for all farmers to be um, abiding by good agricultural practice, which really delivers for biodiversity. And there's a third one, I think, just then in terms of water courses. I mean, our water courses, our rivers, they're one areas that have declined tremendously, and we've treated them very badly, not just agricultural, I mean, um, urban, urban waste water uh, and the like is, is a big problem. Um, we, we're basically, the Irish countryside is a very wet countryside, and it, it's, it's a scandal, really, the, the way in which we've treated our waterways. Um, there are so many services they provide, and we, we tend to be, we've treated them poorly. But this kind of information, as I say, should be core part of any training, any kind of educational program for all the farmers within the countryside. And any efforts to do, to, to increase that would be good. And I noticed, again, Niall saying that the department has, has allocated a large budget for training uh, in relation to biodiversity. So that's really to be welcomed. I think we could have a big impact um, with that measure. And I should also just say the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan, there's other resources there, it's not just these, just simple guidance in terms of what's good practice for biodiversity and what isn't. Try to condense it down to make it very understandable, very clear. We should know what a good hedgerow is for biodiversity, one that allows flowering, berries, got a bit of structural diversity for birds, etc. So, you know, it's brilliant to see all these resources being produced and we need to make sure that they are fed down to the farmers who are uh, farming the ground. Okay, I just want to end up then in terms of some of my personal observations. And these are purely, I suppose, really to try to just stimulate a little bit of discussion. There's, there's positives and negatives or challenges the whole time. And I think it's important, it's very easy, as I mentioned, to say that to get kind of despondent about the, the value of biodiversity and, and farming. But in relation, let's say on the positive uh, column, we see that there is at long last, I think, a recognition that agriculture has a key role to play in addressing um, the biodiversity emergency. Again, whether agriculture, how much it has to blame or not is, is, is irrelevant, but I think we can only achieve um, a better outlook for biodiversity if, if, if we, if we um, get the farming community on board. Um, there's no doubt about it, I think, but the new policy framework can deliver significant benefits for biodiversity but only if the opportunities that it presents are grasped. And that's very important. Um, I'm really pleased to see that there's been some strategically important initiatives um, mentioned, like the National Soil Sampling Survey, the Farmland Biodiversity Survey, the National Land Use Policy. These are strategically important for a biodiversity, to, to enable bi positive biodiversity uh, decision-making. And I would add in, why don't we have a national, you know, pond management survey going on our scheme and maybe a national hedgerow survey. Um, there's now good evidence, we have good evidence base to inform uh, policy and program development uh, for the benefit of biodiversity. And I think what's really important is that we now have a very good network and core of very good knowledgeable practitioners, largely through the EIP programs that are available there to, 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 to draw on and to inform policy. And I think the more that we draw on their advice, the better. And again, positives has never been a better time to get it right. Just let me mention a few of the challenges then I see from my, from my perspective. I think there needs to be a greater level of ambition and urgency for agriculture to deliver more for biodiversity. I mean, I can't stress that too much. We really have to be more ambitious. It's in everyone's interests and it's, it's difficult, but there has to be more ambition. Um, any of the measures um, that are introduced in any new schemes, I think there has to be a clear statement on what aspect of biodiversity loss they propose to tackle. Um, for too long, I think there's been a, an effort to introduce measures that are actually easy to administer as opposed to being easy or uh, being, being specifically tailored to deliver. Um, biodiversity objectives. Um, I think biodiversity data and information needs to form a much more significant component of the agriculture system. I mean, if biodiversity and its funding is to be integrated within uh, agricultural policy, perhaps the information management systems, particularly around biodiversity, have to be increased. And I mean, I suppose I could make the comment that the National Biodiversity Data Centre has built a network and an infrastructure of data management. And I probably feel that there's not as enough use being made of that to inform policy and implementation. We need 
desperately ecological baselines and monitoring needed. Um, if we have schemes that are purporting to deliver on ecolog ecological benefits, we have to prove that with, with evidence. Um, two, just a couple of other points. We really have to make a big drive to change the, perspe the perce perception rather, of biodiversity within the agricultural sector. For too long, I think biodiversity was presented as a problem for agriculture. There's a lot of farmers out there, we, we meet them, who are very interested in wildlife biodiversity. They're, they'll do the right thing, but uh, we have to you know, engage with biodiversity in a positive way, get farmers involved, and to, to turn it rather than it being a negative thing to something positive that they can do to enhance their farmland. Uh, a big one is, I wonder, can we develop a sense of unity of purpose for agriculture and biodiversity? I mean, can we stop really farming and biodiversity becoming a battlefield? And I think and initiatives like this one and the farming uh, with, for nature is another one. There's plenty of, but I wonder, can we, can we avoid it becoming a battlefield? And I suppose the, the final thing is, look, we have to get it right if we are to tackle biodiversity emergency. Agriculture is one of the, lar is the largest land use in Ireland. The opportunities are there. Um, we can achieve a huge amount if we can get it right and if biodiversity can become a core component of agricultural policy in the future. So thank you. I hope I didn't go over, Philip. That's all I have to say. <laughs> of course, you went a bit over, Liam, but thank you very much. It was really a brilliant presentation. And I think we should all be very grateful to you. I think we could, we could put you on, on the circuit, preaching you a little bit. To, to the circus, get, is it, Philip? On the circuit. <laughs> To get, to get that message across. It's a message a lot of us truly believe in. Listen, I'm going to combine. There's, there's been an amazing number of questions coming in, which shows the enthusiasm that you two guys have, have stirred up. So I, I'm going to fire questions at both of you very quickly. It's, it's a composite question that is, is coming. I've combined it out of, out of lots of other questions. So basically, what people generally want to know is when was the damage done, guys? Was it done in the 70s or in the 80s or the 90s or the 90s or the 10 to 20? In the last 50 years, when, which decade was the worst? And then people want to know what's doing the damage. Is it the intensification? Is it the farm chemicals? Is it the monoculture? Is it, or is it that kind of farming practice? And combine all that together, they want to know is the mess up about eligible areas and ineligible areas and taking land out of eligible areas and putting it, clearing scrub and all that, is that having a major effect, either positive or negative? So uh, I think, Niall, you better go first. That other poor man has had a, had a long talk and he needs time to draw a breath. Well, look, I suppose since Ireland joined the EU and since we've had CAP, I suppose we've seen a, 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 an increase in, in, in um, intensification in agriculture. And I suppose that has certainly led to, I suppose, the reduction in biodiversity. There's no doubt about that. I suppose it's very hard to, it's a very difficult question to answer to say, when did it all happen? I suppose um, you, the, I would personally say, I suppose, from the, 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 the early 70s onwards, I would think. And um, when most of the, the I suppose, the, the work had been done to, 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 as Ireland joined the EU and as we, 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 we strive to in increase our agricultural output, but there's no doubt like that, you know, it hasn't halted even, the, you know, even though we have introduced measures, but we do recognize that now. And we're certainly, I suppose, do you know, our, our, our minister, you know, as, as, as Liam has said, we have declared a, a, an emergency, uh, biodiversity emergency, climate emergency uh, in the Dáil, and our ministers do recognise this. And, we, and, and our minister has said that, that look, it, we do welcome the, the, the increased ambition in, in, in the CAP. And while there's discussions ongoing at a trilogue stage between the Parliament, the Commission and the Council at the minute, like, we certainly have our own ambitions and 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 uh, we will do what we can to 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 to, to deliver on on uh, on our targets uh, set out in our national biodiversity uh, action plan. We have, um, you know, we also have agri-climatise now. So we have a number 
of initiatives there now that have set targets for us and they all will impact on biodiversity. Um, so I suppose what else was then in relation to the um, eligible area, that is a bit of a contradiction. There's no doubt about it. We, we, we do recognize that in this department. We brought this up ourselves to the Euro European Court of Auditors last year because on the pillar one side, you need eligible, you know, every to draw down your, your, your basic payment, you have to have an eligible hectare. That means no scrub area on it. So I suppose that has been a contradiction and that has led to some people removing areas of, of, of possibly biodiverse areas on their farm. That has been highlighted by us to the Commission and when we go, we're still in discussion with that. But the European Court of Auditors have recognised that themselves and they've highlighted this to the Commission, that this will have to be looked at going forward. I suppose um, Lee mentioned the Farming for Nature initiative there and certainly we, our department is supporting that, co-funded with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. And we're glad to be supporting um, Liam's team in the National Biodiversity Data Centre in relation to the, 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 the All Iron Pollinator Plan. And, and our, our government now, our minister has given a commitment that there's going to be, as Liam said, a new pollinator plan launched next year. And our department are going to provide funding for a farmland pollinator officer towards this plan that will act as a go between to get best practice out in from the, the for, for pollinators and biodiversity out on the ground and get the message spread out there. So Niall, thanks for that. Liam, the when, the what, yeah. and, and that particular one that Niall was, was dealt with near the end, the eligible and ineligible areas, you must have a very strong opinion on that. I have an opinion, all right. It's for others to know whether it's strong or not. But <laughs> I think, though, I think it's a very important one. There, I'd make two distinctions in terms of kind of let's let's call it biodiversity loss or habitat loss. There's the issue of scale when 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 most of it happened, and the issue of impact, and they're two different things. Like I grew well, I visited North Kerry an awful lot at the time during the 1970s and 80s, where just whole areas were just cleared of what we call, you know, marginal agricultural land and they transformed into, into ryegrass fields. The scale of it definitely to the 70s and 80s was much more, uh, much bigger. The impact, however, I think now, because there's less semi-natural habitats, the potential impact of removing some of these ineligible areas, I think is, is, is really, really remarkable. You know, I just know I live in Kilkenny, rural Kilkenny, and, you know, there's a small, very small patches of semi-natural uh, um, habitat, pond areas, a small bits of scrub and things. The impact, it might only be a small area, but the impact of removing of those now is actually really, really serious from a biodiversity point of view. So I think the scale happened, the large scale happened probably, you know, maybe 20 years ago, but definitely the impact of further habitat loss is, is really serious. Um, and yeah, that, that Niall has already mentioned that this uh, issue around uh, eligible areas, um, you know, it's really important, I think. I just stress the fact that we should, in, we should insist that there's no net, further net loss hab of habitat, of same natural habitat within an agricultural context. So that, that's, that's very good. Listen, I have, I have a deluge of questions and I have a deluge more. I, I'm just going to very quickly, and I need one, uh, one answer. When are the auditors coming back now? <laughs> well, I don't know, but certainly I would imagine uh, um, they will, certainly after the next programming period again, you will see auditors uh, revisit this space in terms of biodiversity. Because like it's certainly, um, you know, everybody knows it's the decline. Everybody said they're going to do something about it. So there's no doubt auditors will come to see that there is a, a change among member states. The, 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 the visit by the auditor seems the, nearly the only thing will move things on quickly because Liam is saying things are very urgent and you said things are very urgent. And yet it takes so long, the commission might look at, at the eligible areas. You know, it's something that should be done, I suppose. But look, at, I want to thank you uh, both Niall and Liam, they were excellent presentations. 
and, and that has been reflected by the comments and questions coming in. People really enjoyed them. And I genuinely thank you on behalf of, of, of the National Rural Network. I want to, before we sign off, this thing, all of this will be up on, on the National Rural Network website. And while we have lots of questions, we're going to try to make some effort to deal with those questions and, and maybe address that through the website as well. Uh, so I want to, before I finish as well, thank James Claffey and of course, Aoife Smith, whose, whose work here in Aoife represents this company on the National Rural Network, has, has spearheaded and led it from the beginning and has done an excellent job. And I want to thank her sincerely for her efforts today. And uh, again, happy Christmas to you all. Stay safe and, and try and stay away from the virus. God bless everybody.